we go. All right. And what you all should be seeing is a picture of the revelation out of the mountain. Should be a picture of the tabernacle. And uh, if, if everyone is seeing that, I just want to make sure, I'm not taking it for granted, everybody yes. can see. Okay. Yes, Pastor, we can see it. All right. Very good. Very good. Okay. So I wanted to, to begin um, just basically going over that image that's always there every Sunday. This isn't the, the exact same one, but uh, I wanted to begin here and then move into talking about uh, what is a priority? What should be the priority of the the day? What should be the priority um, for each one of us, uh, making sure that we are in step with the Lord? So I'm going to open us up in a word of prayer, and I will, I will ask if there's someone that would like to lead us in a word of prayer, and uh, if not, I will do it myself. I'm happy to do it. But if there's someone that would like to, then please do. You can just turn your mute button off and lead us to the throne. Okay, I'll do it. Not unless somebody's talking and they may have forgotten to take their mute button off, but that's okay. I'll do it. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you that we can all gather together, even if it's electronically, we can still make a connection uh, with each other through the means that you've given us, which happens to be electronic technology. So we're, we're thankful that we can do it this way. And what I ask, Father, is for all of the cares, all of the matters that may have happened throughout the course of the day that have led, up, led us up to this moment, uh, for everything that we may have had to deal with that was not that pleasant or maybe disappointing. I pray right now that there would be a relieving of any kind of a stress, any kind of uh, bad news that we may have encountered uh, at some point in this day. And I ask, Lord, that this happens so that our hearts and our, our minds are clear and that the Spirit has a clear path to bring insight and revelation without the, the impeding of something dark and, and looming over us. So I ask, Lord, that uh, for whatever that circumstance might have been, that it can be lifted. And I ask, Lord, that if we are guilty in any way, shape, form, or fashion of, of sin, transgression, or iniquity, or whatever it might be, I ask that you would just cleanse us now by the blood of Jesus, which we never will take for granted, I thank you that you have put within us a desire to walk before you honorably and that if there is something in us that needs to be uh, removed or some sin that needs to be uh, cleaned by the blood, you've given us the gift of repenting, just the gift of faith to believe that you will hear us when we ask you to forgive us. None of these things we take for granted. So I thank you, Lord, that you put within us a desire to repent. And I thank you, Lord, that when we do ask for your forgiveness, the scripture says that you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So I thank you, Lord, that as we ask, we're cleansed and we can stand before you now to receive uh, insight and clarity and direction and revelation and understanding and wisdom and peace from you in the name of Jesus. As we move through the course of the things that we'll talk about this evening, I pray that my brothers and sisters are built up that they are strengthened, that they are fortified with the word of God and with the power of your spirit. These things I ask that you will be glorified in Jesus' name. And everyone that agree with that prayer, you can say amen. 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 All right. So I'm pretty sure there are going to be a few other people that will be joining us unless Unless my deterrent really was effective, because what I did say is, unless you really want to 
be genuine and real and look at um, what it really, what would be the reasonable thing that the Lord is looking for from us that would please him. If, if someone is not really ready to face that, I'm not trying to, to force us to, but at some point we really do have to deal with that. We have to be honest about that because God knows he knows everything about us. He knows when we're hiding something and he knows when we want to come clean. He sees us when we're moving in, in our humility, which I pray all of us are just becoming more and more uh, sensitive to being humble before the Lord. And he realizes when we're standing in pride and uh, he'll deal with us about that because in these days that we're living in, the humble man is going to receive the hand of God upon him to do wonders. The scripture says that uh, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and he will exalt you in due time and he will lift you up. So pride gets us nowhere. It just makes us feel good for the moment. But at the end, it's going to be just an empty, an empty well. Not, not with any real substance in it at all. So as we look into these matters tonight, for everyone that will be on, I pray that we're really, really strengthened, just like I asked the Lord to, to strengthen us. So what you see before you is an image of the tabernacle of Moses and uh, the pillar of fire that is uh, toward the rear of the tabernacle and uh, this is just to uh, reacquaint us with what's going on I, I realize that you all may be very familiar with all of these different things about the tabernacle and the relevance of it it is relevant it is relevant for us to to understand it because when you're looking at the book of revelation and it's making a connection between things that are going to be happening in the future and understanding what John was experiencing there in the 11th chapter of the book of Revelation, that's relevant for us. That, I believe, speaks to the necessity for us to understand why that's in the book and what, what is important about that for us now. Because I believe that, and I've said this a number of different times, I believe that the Lord is opening up the book, the book of Revelation, uh, unlike he has before in the past. So, this is an overall view of the tabernacle of Moses according, he did everything. What you're looking at is the design of God and Moses adhering to very clear, clear set of instructions of what needed to happen to create this portable worship center that was going to be moving with the children of Israel throughout their travels to get to the promised land. And so when you first walk in, let me go backwards here. When you first walk in, there is, uh, if you can see my cursor at all, um, this gate, this entrance, this colorful entrance is facing the east. So when you're walking in, you're coming in through an east entrance and that is called the gate and when you walk through the gate the first thing you're going to see is this altar of which if you go to the image that i had there you'll see that this altar is the first thing that you see priests ministering to it and it's got fire coming out of it because this is where sacrifices were made so when you're walking in you'll see the altar which is like our cross we go to this this altar we present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. We're to die on this. This is like our cross. But uh, this is the first piece that we're going to see, which is in the court area. When you're entering into, when you're entering in through the gate, you're entering into the court area, and in the court area is the altar. The next thing you're going to see is the large vat filled with water, which is the laver. In Hebrew, it's called the mikveh, but it's the laver, and it's for washing. And the washing was uh, commanded by God for all of the priests. They had to come to the, the laver to be washed. So I'm going too fast. Let me back up here. They had to come here and wash. And if they did not wash, the scripture says if they try to enter into the tabernacle structure itself, which we're about to see, they die. So you had to go to the altar, you had to come to the, the mikvah before you go into this 
temple structure or tent structure <coughs> of which you can see uh, the, the gated area, <clears throat> the, the, uh, the gated area in the front, the whole fenced in area, the altar, the laver, and then the tabernacle structure itself. Tabernacle structure itself had five pillars in front of it. Five always speaks of ministry. And, <clears throat> and there was the opening, the door, which you had to enter into, which was like the door um, material was flappable and i've talked about how that you had to kind of lift it to get in but it would move with the wind it would move with new movement and it's it's an indirect statement to say that we're entering into this holy place um bringing us into the realm of the spirit and indicative of our tongues when the bible says that we're all filled with the holy ghost and began to speak with other tongues your tongue moves your tongue it can wiggle, it can waggle, it can move. It's uh, it's 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 the thing that we use to make words, and this flap here is where you entered into the holy place. So it's a picture of what happens when we're baptized in the spirit, and we're moving, if you will, that door of our mouth, and these words will come out that are coming from the Holy Spirit. And when you're walking in, when you're going into the tabernacle structure itself, you'll see one, two, three items, maybe a few other things like an incense um, a carrier that would light the altar. But you'd walk in and here's this, here's this area again, five pillars, the door, that you walk into. And it's a funny thing about the structure itself, it's covered with skins. I'm not ready to leave that yet. It's covered with skins, badger skin, ram skin, woven goat's hair. And then on the inside, the interior of all of these, notice that the ram skin is dyed in red. Wonder why. <laughs> but it's dyed in red. Oh, man, it's just, this thing won't give me... Uh, Bear with me as I'm trying to move through this. I think I've got it on automatic, so it's going to change on me. But I wanted you to see that this is all a statement of, of a, a heavenly image that, that, that Moses was commanded of God to create. Stay still. Stay there. Don't, don't go nowhere yet. It was, it was commanded of God, um, com God commanded Moses to create it this way, which would symbolize things in the heavenly. So when you walk in, uh, it keeps wanting to move on me. Bear with me. Sorry about that, folks. Sorry, it just keeps moving on me. Uh, but I want to get through it quickly anyway. But all of these are the items that you see, like, the first thing you see when you walk into the quartered area is the brazen altar and the laver. And then you walk into the tent structure itself. You see the lampstand, the table of incense, and then the table of showbread. And then beyond the veil, you walk in, you'll see these things, the lampstand, the showbread table, the altar, the incense uh, carrier that puts the uh, fire on this, on this altar that is before the the lampstand uh, before the uh the 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 altar which is there with the lampstand of the table is in front of the veil and the high priest is the only one that could go into that veil but he would stand and he would worship and then he would go in once a year and bring a, a blood offering sacrifice to atone for the sins of all the land but that veil, when Jesus was on the cross, was torn. This is what we read about being torn, uh, ripped when he was on the cross. There's a huge veil that was in that, in that temple, a huge veil. So let's keep moving along here. I'm almost through with this part, but it's just to remind us, we're going into this most holy place. Everyone is supposed to be exiting out of exiting out of uh, the outer court area, ex exiting out of this area where the altar and the laver is. 
We're supposed to be moving past that, moving past that to come into the tinted area with all of these different items that I'm talking about and understanding that this is like your body. It's representative of you being cleansed and you being the temple of God. That's you. You being a sanctuary. So there's a literal one that we're moving into with all these items. And then it's us. These things are symbolic of what's in the heavens. So what you're seeing here, it's, it's interesting that in the book of Revelation, Jesus turns and he sees the lampstand. And I'll just leave it right there. He's actually, this is a picture of him actually being in the temple in heaven. So the veil is removed now, and what's, what we have access to is the Ark of the Covenant, which is the mercy and the judgment seat. So that's what we're moving into. But I wanted to take a moment and also notice that the camp layout, it's very interesting to notice how every, every tribe had to be in a certain place. They had to be in a certain place location like judah issachar and zebulon had to be east gad simeon and reuben had to be south dan asher and nephthali had to be north benjamin Manasseh, Manasseh, and ephraim had to be west everybody had to be where they had to be and moses and the priests had to be in their location too which was directly in front of the tabernacle structure everybody had to be in the place that they needed to be. So, um, all right. So I wanted to, to at least share that. And any questions about what I showed so far? Does everybody, did everybody see that? Uh, you, you might be talking, but I can't hear you. Yes. Okay. So, I wanted us to be reminded of, of that. And, and, and uh, when I don't have the slides moving around on me before I'm ready, maybe I'll go back and spend a little more time just talking about different aspects of that that are related to us right now. However, it's very interesting to me that when, when uh, John is in the um, right here in the book of Revelation, when John turns around, he sees Jesus. Let's let's take a look at that very quickly. He says, I turned to see a voice that spoke with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. This is John in the temple or that 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 structure in heaven. This is what he's looking at. I turned and I saw the seven golden candlesticks and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the son of man, clothed with a garment down to the foot. So here we have a picture of John in that place that we're looking at and seeing, as it says here, I saw the son of man clothed uh, in the midst of the candlesticks. So I want you to understand that what you're looking at here in chapter one is, re is related to what we've been looking at in the tabernacle structure period. He's taken up and he's seeing it and he's brought into what the pattern in the earth is based on. Wow, it's, it's, it's very fascinating. So um, He's about to be told some things, as you know, when you read through the book of Revelation, he's about to be told some things that are, for us, more relevant for us today than ever before. And so when I sent out that note and I, and I asked us to, to come on this call this evening to be prepared to talk about priority, I thought it was important to do that because... As John is being shown more things and he's being shown the churches, it says here in chapter two, verse one, 
And unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, and has bore and has patience, and for my for my name's sake has labored and not fainted. Nevertheless, I have someone against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent and do the first works, less or, or, uh, or else I will come unto thee quickly and remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. Now, anyone want to tell me, uh, is this the first time we're hearing about the church in Ephesus when we're reading in the book of Revelation? Or is there another place that actually talks about the church in Ephesus? You might have yeah, to the book of Ephesians. Uh, the book of Ephesians, I was going to say, but I couldn't unmute fast enough. <laughs> <laughs> right. The book of Ephesians, because it's written to the people that are in Ephesus. And when you're reading through that book, chapters one through six, you don't really hear a, uh, you don't really see a body of people there that seen that they needed to re receive a rebuke about anything. But evidently, over a period of time, and I will say, this is speaking to the first century church and it's also speaking to the project the um prophetic church of ephesus in this generation there's a kind of of church of F, of ephesus or all of them in this day so there was the literal churches and then there's this prophetic projection of things to be understood in these last days that is like the, the church that was in Ephesus, okay? So it's not just, it was only to the church of the first century. It's also written to the church in the last days. Why do I say that? Verse seven, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the spirit saith unto the churches. It was written to one, but now he's saying, Hear what I'm saying to all of them, to the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. And, and, and so we need to understand that it's not exclusive. This isn't exclusive, what the Lord is saying. But it is, I would say, a, uh, a kind of warning to us. And he says to this church that was a very strong church, church that I believe understood spiritual warfare, understood the love of God, the, the, that the body was built up uh, by loving itself, loving each person, because those are the kinds of things that Paul wrote about there in that book, in that letter to Ephesus. But here they're getting a rebuke. And the Lord says, repent here and he says i'm going to re do this quickly uh or i will remove the candlestick out of his place except you repent so he tells him twice he emphasizes repentance and he's saying do the first works so i know we've had this conversation before but i want to approach it looking at it just a little bit differently in terms of this word that is important for today for the contemporary believer today and that is i would say particularly here in the united states where we have a number of different responsibilities and duties and activities that we have to engage in from time to time like work is a requirement and other things may not be as much of a demand placed on our life but yet it is and we might find ourselves being um occupied with a number of different 
issues and matters in our life to where what time we may give to the Lord may be time that we have to, we might say it's time that we have to create to be with the Lord if we can get to it. If we can get to it outside of other responsibilities, which means that it may lose, this time with the Lord may lose its priority. And we can't really ever allow the position of the Lord being the number one relationship that is to be constantly, constantly engaged throughout our life throughout our day, throughout our lifetime, it must be priority. That has to be the priority. But the day may work against it. And what I want to caution us about is, can we look at our lives honestly and say that he has maintained that priority? Or has there come other activities in our life, and they may be not that important. We just like doing them. And we might place a, a priority on making sure we get to do the things that we like, as opposed to maintaining the priority of keeping the Lord, the primary relationship in our life that we demonstrate by the amount of time that we give him and the actions that we give him. So we might say with our lips, he's number one, but everything else in our lives that's got time, that's really showing what's number one. And we are in danger of that thing being an idol. And that will, that will cause a rebuke to come from the Lord towards us, and, and we're living in the day where, you know, rebukes to come, but let's, let's live our lives in a way where we have a reduction of rebukes. I mean, no one's absolutely perfect, and there's things we do that are silly, stupid, but we maybe need to look at our lives to really be honest about what the priorities are, and how do we how do we execute what the priority is in our life? And, and so anyway, talk to me a little bit. What do you think about what I'm saying so far? I guess what you're saying, Pastor, if he's going to rebuke us, let us let him rebuke us for something where we messed up or something we've done wrong, not rebuke us for not spending no time with him. Because that's serious. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Anyone else? All right. If if there's no one else that's going to say anything here, um, I'm I'm showing you that there is a fantastic church. I would say Ephesus was a great church. <laughs> it would have been. Um, I, I would say, if I can, if I have the liberty to say this, it would be at the top of the of the of the list of great churches of the first century. But man, they got in trouble because look, he says here, he says, um, "I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them that are evil, and hast tried them to say that they are apostles and are not, and found them liars." and has bore, and has patience, and for my name's sake, labored, and not fainted. So they are, for all intents and purposes, busy about the work of the Lord, but something has slipped. It's not that they're sitting on their hands not doing anything. They're doing something. As a matter of fact, the Lord goes on and he says, but this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans. The Nicolaitans are the people. It's a, it's a, let me just say it in a quick version. 
It's a form of religiosity where you have leaders and people that are separated by class. And maybe the leaders think that they are more important than the people. And it can't be that way because we're all called into a, a place of being one in the Lord. And even though leaders have a responsibility to lead, and they should be leading, they have to appreciate that they are as um, on the, on the uh, let's just say, on the, 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 the floor of review and examination by the Lord as anyone. And we can't look at ourselves as being, if you're in leadership, you can't look at yourself as being superior. And I believe that the doctrine of the Nicolaitans was that the leaders felt that they were superior. And they may not need to even obligate themselves the way that non-leadership people needed to be serving the Lord. So there's, and Nico means to conquer. Laetans means the laity. Conquer the people. So there may have been this superiority thing that was happening, and it can't be that way. We have to see each other as, as equal with different responsibilities. Am I, am, am I confusing you or am I making sense? Well, definitely oh. making sense. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Lewis. Everybody else, you can take your mute button off for a second. Just let me know you're there. But uh, okay, good. Good, though. Good. So he's got, the Lord is saying, I, I feel you all when you're talking about hating the deeds. What does it say? The deeds. The deeds of the Nicolaitans. They may have been looking like they were about something, but maybe not. I don't know. But he didn't. The people picked up pick up on it and Jesus picks up on it and for whatever however I can say it they seem to be on the same page about that and they may have been on the same page about laboring and maybe on the same page about not fainting but they weren't on the same page about what was important the first works they weren't on the same page about that and that's what I'm saying I'm saying we have to recognize the priority that we've been called to in our relationship with the Lord. Let me go to another place and, uh, and let's just go up here. Let's go here. Uh, uh, here, let's do it this way. First. Here we go. So look at this. This is Peter and he's writing about the return of the Lord and for all of the things that we may hold dear and, and uh, precious about this world, it's all going to change here ultimately. And Peter's talking about how that when the Lord returns, the world is going to be going through a very violent shift. And as a matter of fact, he says, if I look at verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heaven shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burnt up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, he asked this question. This is the question that we have to look at. This is the uh, call back to looking at priority again. What manner of persons ought ye to be? What manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat? Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Therefore, wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, and here's this thing that I blocked, be diligent. This, I think, is the third time in this letter 
that Peter is saying, be diligent about something. So he says, be diligent that you may be found in him in peace without spot and blameless. Be diligent that that is what is happening with you when he comes. When Peter wrote this, this is 2,000 years ago, and the Lord has not come yet. But we're in this day where a number of different factors that we look at are speaking volumes that it appears we may be that generation that really needs to hear what Peter was saying now. What do you all say? What do you think? The word diligent, having or showing care and con uh, consciousness in one's works or duties. That's a very important saying. Uh, you know, I mean, it seems like a small word, but it has a very powerful meaning in this uh, in, in this instance. Yes, just throwing that out there because it's uh, it, it 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 speaks of us. But in other words, what are we doing? What are how are we preparing? How are we showing that we're prepared? Yeah, it's just it's got a lot of connotations there. Yeah, yeah. Amen. Amen. Anyone else? I think he's saying that he wants us to make sure that we are studying our word and getting into the deeper things of the God, of God, preparing for, you know, when he comes in, when he comes again. So we will be where we need to be and um, ministering to others and, and getting other and saving up as many other souls as we can to get there with us. Amen. 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 Anyone else? I would say be consistent. And the word says, you know, that we should be steadfast and immovable in the things of God. Amen. Amen. Excellent. So notice here it says in this 12th verse, looking for the people of God should be looking for the Lord. He says, what manner of people ought you to be in all, in, in what manner of people ought you to be in all holy conversation that God is looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of God? And he's saying it to people, true, 2,000 years ago, but this is what he's saying to them 2,000 years ago. How much louder would he be saying that today, June 21st? 2022. How much louder do you think Peter would be saying that today? <laughs> He'd probably be screaming it out loud. <laughs> he'll, he'll probably be having a bullhorn, really. <laughs> right. <laughs> look at this, folks. Uh, I'm gonna, since this is Bible study, let's let's take a look at something here. This is a number of times that diligent is shown up in scriptures and how it's used. Like in Proverbs 13, 4, the soul of the desireth and hath nothing but the soul of the diligent shall be made fat. The thoughts of the diligent tend only to plenteousness, but everyone that is hasty only to want. Proverbs 22, 29, seest thou a man diligent in his business? He shall stand before kings. He shall not, he shall uh, not stand before mean men. Verse uh, Proverbs 27, verse 23, be thou diligent to know the state of thy flocks. It's like a word to me. It, this, this is the thing that, you know, I am becoming more and more conscientious of how much I, I, I care for you all and that we are called together and that you keep hearing me saying something kind of redundantly, like we're not put together by accident. We're not thrown together by accident. And people that are coming into this particular family, they're not coming here by accident. They're coming here by direct um, dynamics of the Lord moving things in such a way that people will come. And, and I believe that our 
our fellowship is to be one of those places where we take the word of God seriously and we're more interested in being, now hear what I'm about to say, we're more interested in being edified than entertained because the church seems to be given like the world. The world is looking for entertainment. And don't get me wrong. I love good entertainment, comedies, whatever, you know, movies, whatever. But when entertainment is starting to uh, preoccupy time greater than edification, we're out of balance. So we, we have to come back and take a look at, all right, am I diligently going about my business and, and, and me, am I diligent, am I being diligent to know the state of those who could be said to be the flock of this, of this pastor of CFA? It's like, I've got to be, I've got to be um, very conscientious of what the Lord is calling me to do and be faithful at it. So I'm talking about being diligent, but I might be saying these things to myself the most, <laughs> okay? But I know we're all, we all have to be diligent. Look, look at this. Um, Peter, let me come down here to where it says here. Second uh, Peter chapter 3. We've read this part, right? This is what we were looking at before. Oh, man, let me get some of this stuff out of the way. These things. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent. So we've looked at that. But there's all these other places the diligence uh, um, shows up. And 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And we have sent uh, with them our brother, whom we have oftentimes proved diligent in many things, but now much more diligent upon the great confidence which I have. In, it's like diligence is a big deal. This is a big thing. As a matter of fact, where's this other one that I could look at? Um, let's see here. Uh, giving all diligence, yes. Hebrews 6.11, Hebrews 6.11, and we desire that every one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. We're being told about diligence over and over again. Matter of fact, if I go to Hebrews chapter 11, let's just go there just for kicks and giggles. Oops. Hebrews 13, uh, Hebrews, what does it say here? It says in verse 6, but without faith, it is impossible to please him being God. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that what? diligently seek him. This is a big thing. This diligent, and, and this is why I'm saying re-examine priorities to be diligent. Diligent in looking for the Lord. Diligent in having the right attitude. The people that are not looking for the Lord, that could be problematic because it's saying we're, we're more vested in the interest of the world than we are vested in the interest of God. Because it is God's desire that his kingdom will come in full manifestation. That Jesus will come back and rule because he's promised that he will do it. And then the manner that he left, he's going to come back in the same way. But he's, to me, it would seem that he's waiting for something. And, and I believe that one of the things that he's looking for is for the church to move forward in understanding it must be diligent in certain things. If I come back to Peter, Second Peter, and I look at these things here, remember I said 
when we were looking in chapter three, that might have been the third time that Peter said it. Well, let's look at the first two times that he says it. Um, this whole chapter, this whole thing, we need to really get familiar with it. And, I, and I've said many times, you should pray the things that you see here. You should pray them for your brothers and sisters. You should pray these things for you and your brothers and sisters. So as I look at this, and I look at verse 3, um, it says here, According as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, uh, through the knowledge of him that called us to glory and virtue. We've been called to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great, which is greater than great, exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. It's a mouthful happening here, but let's go on to this. And beside this, what are we doing? Giving all diligence, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. Why do we do that? For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you neither that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his own sins. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence. It's like, wow, he's really leaning on this. And he's not done here because we see it again in chapter 3. This is chapter 1. And he said it within the same thoughts of give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, ye shall never fall. Number one, you'll never fall. Number two, for so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm going to stretch you a little bit, and I'm going to say that that entrance, who's to say that when you're doing these things, when, you're, when you've taken into consideration the things that he said about what to add to your faith, the virtue, the knowledge, the kindness, the patience, the brotherly, uh, the, the, the brotherly kindness, and the charity, and then letting those things abound, that if you do these things, you'll be fruitful, you won't fall, and an entrance where? An entrance will be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And he's not just talking about when you die. I'm stretching you now. It's not just talking about when you die. How about an entrance being opened up for you just like one was opened for John and told him, come up hither. Let's allow that for a minute. An entrance. Behold, there was a door that was open to me and I heard a voice say, come up hither and I will show you things to come. How many times have you heard about people and you may have experienced it already in dreams being taken up and shown things by God or praying and something just opens up. I'm telling you that we're living in a day where more and more of that is going to be happening. But it's as we proportionally see that we must be diligent about keeping the priority straight and adding to our faith these kinds of things. And in understanding as we're doing it, we're looking for the return of the Lord. As I alluded to this past Sunday, when we're praying the basic Lord's Prayer that everyone knows, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, we don't fully appreciate but when he says, thy kingdom come, in our minds, we're thinking about the future of when Jesus sets up his kingdom. But that's good. But I believe the Lord showed me that's, that's relative, but I'm really looking for you to understand the kingdom coming 
in you, that my will will be done in you, and that heaven will be opened up because of what you're doing, and that my will will be done in the earth because of you. And if we have people that are um, maturing in that and growing in that, when we get in the same place, there's an amplification of the presence of God, of God and an amplification of a heavenly atmosphere and environment. This is kind of what we're experiencing when we're in times of praise and worship. And praise and worship really should be about our, our adoration and our willingness to say, whatever you're asking, Lord, we'll do it. Because worship is not so much expressed in music as it is expressed in obedience. <laughs> When you're obedient, you are absolutely worshiping because now you're doing, you're showing yourself fully submitted and committed to what the Lord is saying. That's your act of worship. So worship is great with music and we can do that and we'll continue to do that to create the atmosphere. But then beyond that, you're walking out the result of being in the presence of the Lord to do what he says. A couple of weeks ago, I made an I alluded to not wanting to be Luke 646 saints. No one should ever be a Luke 646 saint. What we should be is a Luke 40 saint. A Luke 40 saint is the scripture says the disciple is not above his master, but everyone that is perfect which is mature. Everyone that is perfect shall be as his master. That's Luke 640. But then the Lord throws out a kind of a review there in Luke 646. You know what he says? Why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? That's Luke 6, 46. No one wants to be that, <laughs> okay? So I'm calling us into a place of being honest, looking at your priorities. And I'm not telling you to abandon things that you do. I'm telling you to bring them into balance, bring them into order and give the Lord the worship that he is worthy of. And we're living in this day where it becomes more and more important that this is what we are about and that we are looking for that return of the Lord and we're preparing for that return of the Lord. And he's going to prepare us so that we do not suffer any of the circumstances of the people that have not taken the Lord seriously. And as we began this, looking at that uh, tabernacle in the wilderness, again, you want to be on the inside of the temple structure or the tabernacle structure itself. You do not want to be on the outside, still hanging around the altar and the labor exposed to the air, to the things that are coming upon the nation, upon the Gentiles, and the church that's acting like Gentiles. You don't want to do that. You want to do this. You want to do what we're talking about here. So, um, all right, I've, I've said a lot, and anyone, thoughts, reflections, well, I was thinking, I was thinking about uh, when we first started, and uh, we was talking about you know rebuke, and how the word says, "Open rebuke is better than secret love." And all this week, I've been thinking about the words you brought forth, and uh, you know, reference to God's will be done in the earth as it is in heaven. And I was thinking about that. I'm glad you re I'm glad you brought it up because uh, we were made from dirt. And you said how the Lord wants uh, 
his will to be done in us. So we are earthen vessels. So, you know, that's what I've been really meditating a lot on, that the earth is the earth, but we are earthen vessels and that his will, he wants his will to be done in the earth, but also in us. Amen. Amen. Notice, folks, when you read through that, go back and take a look at Matthew chapter 6, what he says there. Does he say, thy will be done on earth? Or does he say, thy will be done in earth in a very wise, clever way? <laughs> That's the Lord. He's, yeah. He will sneak some stuff in on you. <laughs> Is sneaking in on you. So many, many years ago, back when we were still in church, going over there to the recreation center, Pastor, I remember uh, God had impressed me, really put it in my heart, which is uh, Malachi 310, I think it is, where he says, Has a, my people robbed me? And everybody, you know, keeps on saying, Well, you know, because we didn't bring him stuff for his, for his house, you know, or money or tithing. But he impressed it back then, seven, eight years ago, better what it was. It's our time. You know, if we can give God at least two hours total devotion of two hours and 40 minutes, make it three hours or at least two hours, you know, uh, but total devotion to him, uh, uh, at least two to three hours a day, your life will start seeing some tremendous changes. And, and, you know, sometimes we just get to the point where, well, well I, I, I have to read the Bible for at least two hours. You don't, that attitude needs to change. You got to say, I get to read the Bible for two or three hours. I get mm -hmm. to be with the Lord for two or three hours. Not feel like it's an obligation. I feel like it's a burden because that's, uh, that's, that's you know, I, I don't think God is going to look at us very favorably on that. I was looking, continuing looking at that word diligent. It comes from the Latin diligere or diligere, whatever, which means to value highly, take the light in. But in English, it has always meant careful and hardworking. So if you're a diligent worker, you're not just doing or banging away at your job. You're earnestly trying to do everything right. So when we do our time with God, it's not so, oh, I just, you know, I'm going to read the word, just read over it. No, get into it, study it, listen to it, let it talk to your heart, really dig into it. And you're going to start seeing some changes that are going to start happening. And you're not even going to realize it. And it starts changing your attitude, start changing your mind. And, and it makes you start looking forward to it. I can't wait to get off work half of the time because the first thing I'm going to do is get into my word. You know, it, it's, it's just, it just keeps getting ingrained in you to the point where you hunger for it. It's not just a necessity in, in, in spiritual, but it, even in my mind, I, 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 I control my thoughts. I, you know, it's just so much to it when you really, really want to get into it. Amen. That's and all I, I'm saying for today. <laughs> that's fine, Lewis. Uh, since you brought up the definition on the left side of the screen here, for those of you that can see my notes, I brought this up, and it's interesting. It says, uh, diligentia, as you had said there, Lewis, persevering application, persevering application. There's another one here that says attention, um, attention and care legally expected or required of a person. Attention and care legally expected or required of a person. So there's this perseverance. There is this attention and care that is related to the meaning of this word diligence of what we are to be appropriating to these things of adding to your faith virtue and knowledge and temperance and godliness and brotherly kindness and charity and making sure that your calling is an election scripture and being diligent to to be looking for and hastening to the return of the lord and being diligent about pursuing after the lord because without faith it's impossible to plead that this is what we're this is where we are there is this serious work that I know the Lord wants to do in each one of us. You will not regret it. And look, 
if you don't have a two and a half hour window, then give them a window of what you can do in sections of a day. And it really what it means is it's time that you just focused on the Lord. It might be time where you're praying. Yeah. It might be time that you're um, reading. Yes. It might be time that you're just meditating on something that he said and you're just being quiet. Yeah. And you might be doing something else throughout the course of the day, just listening to something that's helping to build you up. Yeah, that's that's time where you're focused on the things of God as opposed to just trying to be entertained by the world. So it's a, it can take different forms. The purest is always going to be direct communication with God through the word and in prayer. And, yeah. you know, but you, but I'm gonna tell you something that happens when you do this, and you're diligent at it. You're gonna get a blessing of grace from God, which means He's going to say, "Here, let me give you something that's gonna make you want to do this even more." Because I see you're doing it, so I'm gonna do something in you that creates a craving now. I'm going to put that in you. I'm going, to, I'm, I'm going to ignite a little bit more of a fire in you that you're going to want to do this. And, and that is what's going to begin to happen. As you're hungry, he's going to begin to satisfy you so that you want more of what you're eating. So anyway. All right, folks. I know it's a little bit after 8.30. Man, to what you said, Pastor, that is absolutely true. <laughs> yeah, I, I thought it was important for us to uh, to talk about this. Please do note Second Peter chapter one, and do not forget as we as we're noting things. I want to always come back to this. Praying always for you. This is Colossians chapter one. We give thanks to God and the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, praying always for you. There's something in us that has to appreciate how the Lord has given us a love for each other, that we're called together, and we need to, if you will, if I can say it this way, we need to be caring for our brothers and sisters' protection, caring for them and keeping them as much as we can in prayer from the dangers, from the terrible things that are happening in this world. We can do that if we'll pray for each other so that we are abiding under the shadow of the Almighty and we have each other praying that same kind of thing for each other's protection. So we pray for each other. And as we do it, when we do this in verse 9 through 11, for this cause also, says we heard, we do not cease to pray for you. Says it again. We do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long-suffering with joyfulness. Pray that for each other. Okay. Someone want to close this out? Or unless there's some other words anybody wants to say before we get off, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to stop talking, let someone else pray, and then we'll call it a night. How about that? I, I just wanted to say that Amos 8, 11, this has been one of my favorite scriptures, where it talks about there will, become a, there will come a famine in the land, not for food or drink, but for a hearing of the word. And uh, that's why the Lord wants us to be diligent, because people are going to be, um, I really do believe, are going to be seeking us out. Yes, they will. Because of that. And Lord God, I just thank you. Yes. for the gathering of the saints this evening. Yes. I pray, Lord God, that the word will continually dwell in us richly, Lord God. Continue to give us your wisdom and help us to grow in your love. Keep us all on the straight, narrow path, Lord God, and help us endure to the end. 
Lord God, to give you praise, honor, and glory for all that you've done for us and what you're going to do for us. In Colossians, it talks about us being knit together. So, Lord God, I ask that you continually knit this family, this household together in your love. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, amen. 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 Keep each other in prayer. Move forward in prophecy, signs and wonders, gifts of healing, everything. Let's see what the Lord will do. All right. All right, folks. Love you all. That's going to conclude us for tonight. Look forward to seeing you all Sunday. All right. God bless. God bless. Thank you. God bless. All right.